Today's guest is Irene Lyon. She is a nervous system expert. She teaches people around the world how to work with the nervous system to transform trauma, heal the body and the mind, and live full and creative lives. She's amazing. I, you, you'll hear, I'm geeking out hard on this episode. I wanted to ask her a million questions. She's so knowledgeable. Um, her online programs and classes have reached over 9,500 people in over 90 countries. She has a master's degree in biomedical and health science, and she has a knack for making complex info easy for all of us to understand. Um, we dive into exactly how are you probably heard of like the autonomic or automatic. Some people say nervous system, and she really dives into these different responses that we have to trauma or how we were raised and the patterns that we received and how we can go into not only fight or flight, but also freeze and how that actually works, um, within the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. She really, I learned a lot on this episode, things that I've never heard before. And so, um, you know, I think all of us can take something away from this. We've all had traumas or um, survival mechanisms that we've developed from some sort of stimuli in our lives. And I know you guys are going to take away a lot. So um, if you want to find out more about her, you can go to her website. It's Irene Lyon, L-Y-O-N.com. We'll link that in the show notes. Um, and on Instagram, it's Irene Lyon as well as her handle on there. So we'll go ahead and dive in. This is a treat. I freaking loved this episode. Here is Irene Lyon. Okay. So I was telling Irene before we started that I never cease to be amazed at how the universe starts teaching me stuff. And I get in this, like, just my whole world gets consumed by something that I'm learning either in health or spirituality or something like that. And boom, I get on a podcast and here is an expert with all the answers. I'm like, thank you universe. Thank Aww. you for the cheat sheet. So if you are interested at all in healing um, understanding how your body is interconnected with your, the way you behave, the way you see life, the choices that you make your nervous system, like this is going to be a treat for you. It's going to be for me too. So mm. I thought we could start off with what, what on a, on a basic level, like, what do you think people need to understand about how their nervous system is impacting their health and their daily life? Right. So I usually take 12 weeks to teach this. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, she I, does have, what do you call it on your website? It's the best I name. Have, I have a few programs, but my, my kind of the big enchilada is smart body, smart mind. Okay. And that's and then, kind of as much as I can fit into something so that people don't get scared and run away. Cause we could go for years. With <laughs> um, so but, sum it up into five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I definitely can. I can definitely dissect and give you uh, the, the nuggets that are most important Thanks. at this level. So the thing to understand is our, we have many nervous systems. So I'm going to start with that. Yeah. Um, you know, quick little anatomy lesson. We have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. So yeah. the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So everyone kind of knows where those things are, right? Center, they're at the center of our body. And then the peripheral nervous system is kind of like it sounds, it's the nerves that come out of the brain and spinal cord into the peripheral yeah. area of the body. If you think about peripheral vision, yeah. the peripheral nervous system has a couple nervous systems. One is the autonomic nervous system. And then if I simplify it, the other one would be, um, I like to say the sensory motor nervous system. You know, when you work out, for example, when you pick up weights, like you're sensing the weight and then you have to um, effectually change your tone, yeah. breathe to get, whether it's a five pound weight or a 50 pound weight, you're right. going to change, right? Or I've got this very cold cup of coffee in front of me. If it was scalding, scalding hot, I would, I would sense it as I, and I might not press totally hard. And so our nervous system, this, that's the peripheral motor sensory movement senses. But then this autonomic nervous system is incredibly important. And usually when people say nervous system, and when I say nervous system, I'm talking about the autonomic nervous system. And so there are two parts okay. of this that are very yeah. important. One, um, again, I have got my coffee here. If I have a drink, <clears throat> it's going to go into my food tube, into my stomach. My body's going to do as it does with it. Same with food. That's all governed by the autonomic nervous system. Just like um, uh, my immune system. If I cut myself, you know, blood clotting mechanisms happen, sleep, reproduction, 
all of that lymph, that is the autonomic nervous system, automatic. The yeah. other part of the autonomic nervous system is our survival responses. Fight and flight, most people know those. So, yeah. you know, you, you get into a stressful situation, there's adrenaline, oh my gosh, I'm feeling freaked out, I gotta get out of here, or I need to like um, protect, you know, if you're in an attack situation or an accident, you might protect yourself. But then there's something called freeze. So fight, flight is like the get up and go protect. But then freeze is what we do when we can't fight and we can't flee, when we can't leave the scene, when we yeah. can't set a boundary, when we can't cover our eyes and say stop or push someone away, for example. And so the freeze is very complex and maybe we'll get deeper into that. But to make it even more complex, this autonomic nervous system has two branches. So I just said fight flight. That's the sympathetic. Most people actually have heard of that, the sympathetic yeah. nervous system. The, the freeze is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, a lot of people have heard of that. Yeah. This is where when it comes to trauma and the human body and the nervous system, we need to get a little more specific because the parasympathetic nervous system has many branches. Mm. And it governs not just the shutdown, freeze, collapse, protect, hibernation, shock, but it's also um, what gives us rest, digest. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, you've probably heard of that parasympathetic rest, digest. Yeah. That's true, but that's one portion of this parasympathetic. Yeah. The other portion of the parasympathetic it, like we're looking at each other right now and I'm smiling and you're sort of smiling and you're nodding your head and your dimples are coming out and, <laughs> and your teeth are showing and you're laughing a little bit. That is also part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's, mm. if I get fancy, that's the ventral aspect of the vagus mm. nerve and the vagus nerve mm. pretty much is our parasympathetic nervous system. It's like 75 to 80% wow. of it. So the nervous system is big. It yeah. governs a lot. It isn't just about survival. It's about resting, digesting, digesting, repairing, recovering, rejuvenating, but it's also our social connections. And so if I kind of t t bring this back um, full circle, when we think of um, something that throws our nervous system off, threat, trauma, bad situations, bad, scary things that happen to us, it throws this autonomic nervous system into a tailspin. Some people will fight and flee till their death. Others will try, but then they can't. This is very indicative of children, infants who are in stressful situations. They can't fight, they can't flee, so they shut down, they freeze. We're not meant to stay in these survival mechanisms. We're meant to be in them for like minutes, seconds. That's it. But then, because of the way human nature is, we're not in the wild where we're just being hunted or we hunt, or if we get an accident or we have something, we pretty much die. We have all these things that keep us going, but we also have a much higher brain that can in some strange way, depress and suppress and keep us going, even though we're in this collapsed, hibernated, frozen state. Mm -hmm. The one last thing I'll say, well, not the last thing, but the ne next thing I'll say is this nervous system, this autonomic nervous system that governs our fight, flight, freeze. As I said, it also governs our digestion, heart rate, blood pressure, lymph, hormones, all that. When we're living in a state of stress all the time, a state of survival, when this fight, flight, and freeze is just on, even low level, it impacts all of those other autonomic processes. And so this is the connection that is rarely, it's no, known more now, but this is why those who are very stressed have tummy troubles, have immune system problems, have heart problems, cancer. There's no repair of the cell because the system isn't going into rest, digest. It's not engaging socially. It's living in either fight, flight, or freeze. So the nervous system, again, is a huge it's a huge um, mm -hmm. symphony of responses, interactions with the nervous system. It keeps us safe, it keeps us protected, but it can also do that to our detriment. 
hope I'm making sense. Yes, definitely. Like you just added, uh, something that I didn't realize about mm-hmm. this. You know, I, I, I think most people, if oh. you're interested at all in health, you kind of hear parasympathetic and sympathetic a yeah. lot. And, um, I, I didn't realize that the, the, the freeze and, you know, people say fawn, you know, those were, those are parasympathetic responses. So where my mind is going is like, cause I usually, what I think is, okay, if somebody has gut issues and they have trauma, they're like locked in their parents or sorry, they're sympathetic. And that's why that's not operating. Like what about the people who have those freeze or fawn responses? What, how does that impact like digestion and yeah, yeah, Yeah. their health physiological processes? Yeah. So one interest, so fawn is kind of on a different shelf. Okay. okay. Um, and we can talk about that, but fawn is sort of a more advanced trait that humans have, even though we, when we hear the word fawn, we think of, you know, animals, but, and they do that too, but I'll put that to the side. So, and that's like people pleasing type survival, people pleasing, but it also can get physiologic. I'll say one little Mm. piece. Um, like (laughs) there will be in a family system that is very stressed out. And I know you've mentioned that you had a little bit of that, if not a lot, um, let's just say a parent is chronically ill, that this, the system in the house is very depressed, very collapsed, very just not well. And let's say there's a, an offspring and they want to be more vibrant and different. Yeah. Right? If that system doesn't allow for that, a child will actually fawn, I say that with air quotes, into being collapsed to match the energy wow. of the family system. And then with that, because they're then depressing their nervous system and they're putting it into kind of this low gear, like, you know, gear one, gear two, um, they will actually create a chronic illness Wow! because they're not um, expressing, they're not putting themselves into good ventral relationship and they're sort of mimicking the family system. This is why, wow. you know, uh, I know there's a huge field of genetics. It's like, oh, your genes give you this illness. And I beg to differ sometimes. I'm like, yes, genes are important. I have brown hair, I have brown eyes, you have blonde, you know, those things are real genetic things. But when I think about these traits that families have for certain illnesses, Mm. if you really get into it and look at these deeper levels, it's like, is it genetic or is it the epigenetics? Is it the expression of the person because of the environment they're in? When we're little, it's, it's a scary thing to consider being taken out of the family, right? right? Like when you're four, you will die if you get kicked right. out on the street. And so you shift and change to be amenable to that environment. So if I go back to the thing about freeze and the gut and the gut's a really good example. Um, so let's just say a little person is under intense stress when they're growing up. And we'll say it's, it doesn't have to be an abusive family, right? But there's stress. They can't mm-hmm. be themselves. Maybe mother is sick. Maybe father is never home or vice versa. It doesn't matter. There's just stress. And so that kid cannot fight and they can't flee, but they know they have to stay as I was just saying. And so they can't express this energy. And so unconsciously the system puts them into this freezy state Mm. over time. It becomes what we would call shut down and collapse typically, because there's always variations here. And the reason why that happens is they can't express the fight flight. Now, the interesting thing is that when they go into that collapse and I'm going to distinguish this. So freeze, we could say is like the shock, like, holy cow, I just got into an accident. I'm going numb to preserve my body. But if that continues, the system can't keep that rigorous freeze, it will collapse. And it's sort of that postural, very kind of toxic shame collapse you'll see in people, rounded shoulders, depressed, sunken in the chest, that kind of thing. But in that moment of going into that collapse, that continues. But the thing that stays, what's still in the system, Tara, is the fight and the flight. So if we think about it, like a car engine is a crude example. It's like the gas is on, it's being revved, but the e-brake is on. 
And so it's like this revving inside right. of the entire system. It isn't just in the gut, it's in the nervous system. It's in the chemicals, it's in the expression of cortisol, but, or maybe the, um, the uh, fatigue of it. You know, we know that a lot of folks with gut problems also have what we would consider chronic illness, fatigue, mm -hmm. um, adrenal fatigue, burnout, right? because they've been pumping out so much cortisol that the system finally goes, I'm done. And yeah. then the adrenals are exhausted. And then there's no cortisol to help the inflammation of the body at the natural level, right? That's why we give someone with inflammation, not that I agree with this, steroids, corticosteroids to take the, the inflammation out, which might be okay for a tiny bit, but over right. the long term, it breaks the body down. And so if we go back to this person who is um, chronically in fight flight, but then they have this freeze break on it, what occurs is the system is essentially in a state of chaos. Wow. The fight flight is bursting, but we've got this freeze saying, stop, stop. Harm, it's sort of like depressing, suppressing the system. And then this is where, if we think of someone with gut problems, if I go back to my example of drinking something, eating something, yeah. we want flow to happen, right? We want the, the valves to open. We want the gastric juices to release. We want um, the linings to, to, to um, it's called peristalsis, if I use the fancy term, move the food through, excrete, suck up uh, micronutrients, water, all those sorts of things. And then we poop it out, we pee out stuff. It's a flow. It's a, a mechanism that goes in one way. When it's healthy, when the system is not in fight, flight, freeze, but when we're in fight, flight, freeze, the system, and I'm going to use my hands. I don't know if people can see us, but if you're watching on YouTube, if yeah, not, okay. you're out. <laughs> so imagine, you know, flow is the hands going both in the right direction, like e, like just open and closing, open and closing, but chaos at the fight, flight, fight, flight, freeze level would be one open and one closing. And then one closes and the other opens really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, it's going to relax because I have a moment of chill, but then <gasps> something scares me. And then fast, 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 close, close, close. And so what we hear from people that say have chronic um, gut problems, IBS, Crohn's, is they'll say, I have explosive diarrhea, for example, alongside chronic constipation. Mm -hmm. And it cycles back and forth, back and forth. And I never know what's going to happen. That is a sign of a of the autonomic nervous system physiology, basically governing this gut in this cacophony, basically. It's like a symphony that has no conductor, yeah. right? It's just craziness. Yeah. Then if I give another example, because not everybody has gut issues, um, this is what a migraine headache would be. Constriction, dilation, constriction, dilation. This is what... Um, uh, hormonal issues would be. This is what cardiovascular responses that are totally erratic would be. Um, things like POTS, if you know what that is, that's a term um, that des describes where you stand up and you might faint because the blood pressure can't match the change in gravity different differential. Um, wow. It's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's basically a very common um, symptom syndrome of dysregulation of the nervous system. And then we think that it's a cardiovascular problem. And while it is, it's actually been driven by this abnormal chaotic cycling of fight, flight, and freeze. So, so that was a lot. That, that was, was amazing. Lot. No, okay. I'm like, I know there's a lot of people on the edge of their seats because I mean, I'd say this is like at epidemic levels right now in the world. Like it's like yeah. every client I get <laughs> pretty much, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. so if somebody's listening to this, actually, my first question is, mm -hmm. are you saying that this dysfunction, I guess, or dysregulation of the nervous system is, is almost always rooted in like the emotional patterns developed maybe in childhood or at some point in your life? It's deeper than the emotions. Okay. So it's interesting because the emotions are important and we definitely need to be familiar with our emotions and express them and feel them. But when you really get down to kind of like the meat and potatoes of it, emotions, um, they bubble up and they come from sensation. Hmm in the body. And usually that sensation is somewhere within the viscera, within the core, within the organs. Mm. 
And this is why um, many people will say, many of my students will say, I've been doing talk therapy forever. I've been working with my emotions forever and I'm yeah. still sick. I'm still depressed. I still right. have problems, all those things. And they think that they're doing emotional work. And I'm being very general here, right? Yeah, I know what I mean. They, they, they think they're doing emotional work, but they're actually being cognitive about the emotional work. They're having a thought pattern around the emotion. They're trying to figure it out in their brain. Right. But when we get at the core of this, most of the people that I see um, ha- don't have just one thing bad that's happened to them. Like yeah, right. it's a lifetime of stuff. Um, it's parents that didn't know how to treat them well, didn't know how to hold them, didn't know how to change them with care. You know, their diapers um, put too many expectations on them, abused them in ways that are socially acceptable. If we think about spanking and letting a baby cry it out when they're crying, I mean, that's a whole other topic right there. And so emotions are expressed from the sensations of the body when we're really, really young, like infant, those first three years of life, Tara, are so critical for building good nervous system regulation, which then feeds emotional regulation. Mm -hmm. But when you have a crying infant that is either cold or hungry or tired or has a, a belly that isn't feeling well, they're not saying to you, I'm sad or I'm angry. They are in a physiological reaction response. And the goal, the job, if you will, of the caregiver, the the parent, whomever, is to be with and attune to what's happening. But you're not going to say to a five-month-old, oh, just feel your sadness, honey. Yeah. You know, yeah, I see you're so angry. Just keep screaming. (laughs) No, it it doesn't work, right? Yeah. You have to hold them and you have to soothe them. Or if they're hot, you take some clothes off. If they're hungry, you feed them. If they're dirty in their diaper, you change them, you make them more comfortable. It is, it is that attunement and handling and care and connection that then brings them out of their stress response because their body is in some form of stress. Doesn't necessarily mean bad, but by doing that each day, every day, and then you as the adult or the, the older sister or wherever showing up in a calm, interested state, without harshness in your fingers, right. handling them with, with um, tension, mm-hmm. it infuses into them safety. Mm. And so it's really interesting because a lot of my students are like, when are we going to work with emotions, Irene? And while I talk about anger and sadness and these things, we actually don't hit them directly. We work with the physiology wow. and we work with how we feel ourselves in relationship to what comes up and what's in the environment. Wow. I'll and just, if, okay. and if I add one more thing, but remember how I said there's the two parts of the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic and the sensory motor, by actually working with the movements of the body and how we sense and how we act, that starts to reverse engineer the, the autonomic nervous system because wow. they're connected. Wow. Wow. Okay. I'm just going to share real quick. Cause I know you guys don't want her to ever stop talking like me, but oh, just no. to back that up, like I had a, you know, some of my audience may have heard the story before, but I had a very traumatic relationship after my divorce. It was very, you know, all my fawn stuff was like to the max and I just completely self-abandoned and it was, yeah, it was, it was rough. And I, yeah. it was traumatic for me for sure. I lost yeah. everything and it was scary oh. time for me. I did a lot of talking, a lot of therapy that really helps. Right. right? Yeah. Um, And then I went to this, like, I don't know what you would call it, healing type event. Um, and they had punching bags. And I, at this time in my life thought that I was so healed from that thing. I'm like, I have compassion. I have forgiveness. I wish him the best. Like, I'm actually grateful it happened. It's all good. I'm like, I'm so good, you know, but I witnessed this man who this is his first experience doing anything like this. His dad had been abusive to him. And I, oh gosh, it makes me want to cry just thinking about it. But Mm -hmm. I mean, he just started once he started wailing. I mean, he just, it all came out all the rage. And then he just fell to the ground, just like crying. Holy cow. It was like really amazing to watch. And so I was like, Mm. you know what? I haven't done that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I have not done that. I have not physically released any of the anger or any of those things that I felt in my body, you know? And so I was like, I'm going to, 
here we go. Let's dig it all back up. Let's dig it yeah. all back up. I'm going to yeah. do it. And I cannot tell you that what I told people after that is I, I felt like I had that. I, I don't know how else to put it. I was like, I feel like I felt like I had a complete nervous system reset after that. I mean, yeah. I freaking wailed, like just yeah. punch all the swear words, all the things all came out and it truly, mm-hmm. it, it impacted my, how I felt in my nervous system for days after that. So just backing that up for sure. Um, and what was the other thing you said that I wanted to comment on? Um, I, well, okay, let's, let's shift here. Um, well, I'll comment on that anger thing. If yeah. I can. So the anger piece is huge, right? It's like, it is part of our life force energy to protect um, aggression is it can be very healthy. I have a whole like list of videos in that where I've done aggression and anger. I even title it sort of anger is medicine. Anger is medicine. When we get it out in a healthy way, as you said, you felt completely different. Yeah. When we think about anger, we think of it as an emotion, but when you were doing that, that it was physical, it was sensory. Yeah. Right. You're feeling this, this, I mean, you feel it. someone cuts you off in traffic. There's a rush of adrenaline through your arms and you want to like, right. You want to squeeze, you want to hit. It's very physical. Right. And part of the healing of this stuff of the fight, flight, freeze being trapped is definitely releasing that fight energy. This is fight energy. Yeah. And you, from what I can tell you're healthy you're well, you know, you've got your stuff together. You were doing talk therapy. So you were able to know what was happening. I say this because for some, it won't be enough to just punch a bag. Yeah. Yeah. There needs to be a connection to that internal, you know, like, and, and it can be, and if it's scary, this is my one thing with anger. If you are in any way hesitant to punch that bag or growl or say F off, then you're not ready to express it just like a mother bear would never hesitate if a wolf was trying to get her cubs. Right. No, has like, Hmm, I don't feel yeah. comfortable doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? she, she ain't gonna, she's going to express it fully. Right. And so at that level, cause we're also mammals, yeah. we have to be ready and prepared and depending on where someone is on their healing journey, yeah. they may need to do some work. Yeah to be really grounded in their foundational capacity yeah. because you can trip the system out into an autoimmune reaction, huh. a psychotic break, wow. not sleeping. Like I've had people who have not really followed my advice and have gone into doing really deep aggression work. And then they're like, I haven't been able to sleep for a month. I'm like, wow. I told you not to do that. Right. Wow. And yeah. so this isn't just scare anyone, but that's the, that's the clincher. If you are being forced to express anger and you don't feel ready, don't. Wow. And that's where these group dynamic conferences I yeah. worry about because wow. there's peer pressure. Well, everyone's right. doing it. I better get the bat, but I, I don't want to do this. Right. So wow. as you're doing that, the system is overriding the natural desire to say that's not safe. Wow. Make wow. Sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of want to hit on the people who were listening about like, you know, they're um, relating to like the digestive issues or yeah. the migraines and all of that stuff. Like, I'm sure they're like, like where, where, where's a good starting point? Like what, yeah. like I, I, they want it, you know, they're trying, they're like reading books, listening to podcasts like this. And they're just mm-hmm. like, I, what's the path. And I'm sure you're smart body, smart mind. That's like what this is, yeah. but you know, on, for general recommendations, like starting point for healing starting point is always education Mm. and this is the part that's really different with how I frame my work versus someone who's gonna just give you some breathing techniques yeah or whatever you know right um and the reason why Tara is because because we're all so different right yeah. So my analogy for this is important. I mentioned the mama bear with the cubs yeah. a second ago. So bears in Canada, I don't know, do you have bears in Utah? You definitely have them in Colorado. And yeah, Wyoming. technically I've never seen one. But. <laughs> so you've got bears in the United States in the Northern parts of the area, right? Yeah. The, the bears here, the mother bears and the mother bears in say Wyoming, they're going to treat their babies, their cubs exactly the same. There's no two ways about it. We know that 
right? Like we know it just yeah. like bears in Russia and Siberia treated exactly the same way. Mm. Humans not like that, right? Yeah. How my mother was raised is going to be different from how your mother was raised right. from how my husband's mother was raised. And then how they raise us is determined on who their partner is, where they right. live, it, what they have. Do they have daycare? Do they not have daycare? Right. Um, religion, totally. um, the books they read, the type right. of pediatrician they have. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal when you consider how we're raised so differently. And yet we still have mammalian physiology that wants to be treated like that baby cub. Yeah. We want to be cared for. You would never put a baby cub in a dark a cave to sleep by themselves. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. always with mother. And so if we think about how some kids are allowed to sleep with the parents, other kids have to be in a crib. Right. And so I give you this little vignette to say the education is so important and really deep education about the nervous system. Yeah. Because when we start to uncover the stored fight flight freeze in the system which can be symptomatic it can be these migraines it can be the gut problems it can be the the heart that seems like it's got an arrhythmia hormonal dysfunction all these things relational troubles we need to understand that oh my goodness i think this is i think this is that freeze that irene was talking about on tara's show yeah. I'm finding myself numbing out as my mother is talking to me about what I have to bring for Christmas dinner, for example, you know, we just right. have Christmas. and it's like, I never even realized that I completely dissociated when I'm invited to family events. I'm just picking a story. Right, right. 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 Or every time I drive down this street, I just realized that I blank out and I don't even know that I just drove this kilometer. Cause that's where I had an accident when I was five. Or right. that's where I saw an accident when I was five. Yeah. Or that's the school where I right. was, where I was uh, ridiculed and bullied. Yeah. And so when we start to understand the theory, and then with that we start to track how our physiology is reacting to certain things. Right. Or being triggered, if we want to use that word, we can actually then start to be like, okay, what am I feeling? Yeah. Am I here? And so the next thing after the education is. I kind of call it the one, two, threes, the ABCs, one, two, threes of nervous system health. One of them is learning how to orient. I don't know if you've come across that mm -hmm. term, mm -hmm. but basically our orienting response, it involves our senses, but usually mostly our eyes. But, you know, if there's a large bang outside of your door, you're going to flinch mm -hmm. a little bit and look, you're going to hear, you're going to orient to that potential threat. Mm -hmm. When someone has been under a lot of stress, threat, whether it's abuse or chronic shouting or whatever it is in the family system, or maybe they were a child that was under a lot of surgeries because they had a tumor on their spine. You know, I have lots of clients that had lots of surgeries when they were young. So it's not necessarily abuse that creates this, but there will become what's called a, mm, a, an overly defensive orienting response. This is hypervigilance. Yeah. You see it in people's eyes. If you start watching like shows and you turn off the volume, you can tell by how someone's eyes are if they're stuck in some form of survival energy still. Mm -hmm. or I did that. I, I've lived that. I know <laughs> I, the poor guys I dated after that relationship. I was hypervigilant AF. I'm like, no one's going to trick me this time. I, I, I oh, don't yeah. really wake up to that. I was like, yeah, okay, you got some healing girl. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So this orienting thing is, is so um, biological, we need it. And one of the ways to retrain the system into a bit more um, regulation is to teach it how to explore orienting, mm. as opposed to fright orienting. Mm. Now, this is where it gets even trickier. Some people because of their past to even say to them, just look out the window and gaze at the wind, at the, the sky and the, the trees and oh, look at the picture over there. For you and me, that might actually be really pleasant. It's kind of like a mindfulness scan of the, mm -hmm. the world you're in. That's why looking at vistas can be very nice for people. Mm -hmm. But for someone who has immense stored survival energy because their trauma was so insidious and from so early on, 
sometimes you'll get them to orient and all they'll feel is terror. Wow. Because the environment was what was bad. Wow. And so those folks have tunnel vision. Those folks, and again, I'm generalizing, don't want to engage with the world because it's terrifying. Mm. I'm not a big believer in the the labels of introversion, extroversion. Mm. I actually, I'd love to hear about that. I actually mm. think that as humans, we need we we are meant to engage, but we're also meant to be internal because of our higher brains. But what occurs is this overly mm, wired physiology that is just wanting to protect and disengage from the world because the world was so scary. Right. And so they become in, in, internal, insular, introverted. Yeah. Whereas, and I'm sure you've known people who are, were the class clown. They can't feel their emotions. There's just a joke always has to come out when they feel something they don't like, they let's go have a party. Let's, right. let's go be boisterous. Let's play some loud music. And again, there's nothing wrong with going to a party, socially engaging, right? but they overcompensate by this externally expressive Mm -hmm. um, affect that protects them from feeling this, this uncomfortableness that's inside. I don't like this. So I'm just going to express versus someone who's like, I don't like this. I'm just going to go inside. Wow. So, right. so like, I, I actually think we I have love both. that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I it's so funny you said that because I was having a conversation last night about introversion and extroversion, and I was like, I'm like, I guess I would consider myself extroverted, but I also definitely like to my own time. Yeah. But I was like, I I was like, maybe I'm wrong because I don't I don't feel like I identify with introversion for sure. I love meeting new people and learning new things. Mm-hmm. Like this is like my favorite, you know. Totally, yeah. But I was like, I it seems like there's a, it's like a fear response or like judgment or something like that. So I love, um, hearing about that. It's, but what you're saying is that like the extremes of either are just both self-protective mechanisms from what I've seen. It's interesting. I, yeah, Yeah. that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and the one thing I will say is the reason I know that I think this might be accurate, of course, is my theory is that as I work with students who are terrified, like they start up terrified leaving the house, they don't wanna engage, or they're externally engaged all the time. It's like they balance out. Those who don't wanna engage find themselves actually wanting to go to a coffee shop and be around people. And those who were terrified to be alone actually start liking being alone. Yeah, yeah. So there's like this balancing out. Like I said, I really think that as human beings, we're meant to have a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, can you talk about, I, it's kind of like, I think it's like a pop psychology term, but you hear about like trauma bonding, but I'm, what I mean by that more is like, there's, it seems like pretty common that there are certain people that you're like, you gravitate to like almost on a physiological level Mm -hmm. that remind you of someone who was toxic (laughs) or not, Mm -hmm. that's toxic is not the best word, but you know what I mean? Someone, an unhealthy relationship. Can you, do you have any insights on that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I go back to the example of, um, little kid that was raised in an environment that wasn't safe, they become who they are based on their environment. So um, I'll use my husband as an example (laughs) because he's, and I'm allowed to talk about this story. Our traumas are very different. He was in an abusive environment. I wasn't. Um, Divorced parents, father that was very um, aggressive and always on edge. And so when we have that environment growing up, it's all we really know. Yeah. Unless of course, and this is where, again, it gets so diverse is if you spent a lot of time at say grandma's house and it wasn't like that, or you hung out at the neighbors all the time and it wasn't like that, you'll get, you'll kind of rub off on different ways of being, Yeah. but let's just say there wasn't that right. And you were always in this toxic environment. You will only know how to interact in that way with toxic people. Yeah. Like you can only be yourself fully (laughs) kind of, Well, you, you aren't even yourself. This is where it gets interesting is you have to change who you are. You only know how to be yourself by remanaging (laughs) and rearranging your internal physiology to stay safe. Like my, my husband would say, you know, when he was a little kid, 
after school when no one was home, he loved it because he had, you know, yeah. the house to himself. And then, you know, five o'clock rolls around the garage door, you know, goes up and instantly he would go into survival mode because that's when wow. dad is coming home. He would then have to rearrange himself to then relate to, to father wow. and change. And so when we think of things like trauma bonding and how we seek out relationships based on our history, what often happens is we will find a match that matches what we know from our history. And it might be the way that dad was, or maybe it was the way that mother was, and it was slightly different. But what often occurs is the, when someone starts to heal, this is how you know something good is happening, is when you've done, you've been doing this work and you get into say, it could be a friendship or it could be a romantic relationship, doesn't matter. And you start to feel terrified or you start to feel kind of gross. Like this seems really icky, mm -hmm. but your cognitive brain is like, but it's so safe. Like this person is, is, is connecting with me. They're not walking all over me. They're allowing me to express, but they still have boundaries. If that is completely foreign to you, it's actually going to feel gross. Mm -hmm. It's going to feel not right. It's going to feel terrifying. Whereas the abusive, you know, stonewalling, mm -hmm. um, aggro ignoring kind of energy is actually oh yeah I totally know this right I know. this is easy right it yeah. allows me to match the physiology that I am used to and so this is where a lot of people will flee positive relationships because it's so terrifying it doesn't seem right or it's so it's so foreign it seems unreal yeah um, wow Thank yeah. you for thank you for that. That kind of yeah. led me to another question I had for you. Hmm. We'll probably let's see if we can squeeze a few more in. Okay. Um, I I was listening to you on another show and you were talking about um, shame and disgust yeah. and um, I thought this was interesting because like so often a lot of our it's I, I feel like we kind of like jump to um, our reactions, like all being like trauma, trauma responses or whatever, but a lot of, I'm kind of leaning more into like the learned behavior stuff you're talking about of like, this is how we react to you. And this is how, you know, and you see this, right. You see this with kids. Mm -hmm. They've got like an abusive or maybe a little bit emotionally abusive parent and they shame them for things and they start doing it to their younger siblings, you know? And mm -hmm. so, but I, I loved what you were talking about um, maybe we can lace these together, but I loved what you were talking about with disgust because yeah. you said you're like, a lot of people don't talk about this. And I'm like that you're exactly right. They don't. And I think this is so interesting. So, mm -hmm. you know, going into the core relationship again, as a child, can you speak on this topic of disgust and why it's so important? Yeah. So disgust is like one of the six main mammalian emotions. So there's joy, anger, fear, sadness, surprise, and disgust. Huh. And, you know, if you go online, I'm sure there'll be others there, but those are like yeah. the four ones um, uh -huh. that other mammals have. And disgust falls in with toxic shame. So there's two types of shame. It's quite controversial, but there's a healthy shame and there's a toxic shame. And so toxic shame is the kind of shame that would be a parent or a teacher or whatever, or an older sibling telling the, the little person, you're worthless, you're stupid, nothing you do is right, you're, you're an idiot, how, you know, it, it puts the, per, the, the little one into a collapse. So it's sad. Like the, I know, it's the tail between <laughs> the legs, it's the, okay, I guess I'm no good at anything, and, but it gets internalized. Um, and so, and I'll talk about healthy shame in a second because it's important to balance it out. Um, and so what happens is typically in that situation, that is just not a one-off event. That is happening all the time. Uh -huh. And you breed this, this little person who is basically wounded and yeah. doesn't have any healthy life force energy mm. because any time that they try to be expressive or exuberant, and of course I'm generalizing again, they're yeah. somehow hit down shut down 
And it doesn't have to be abuse. It could be like um, coming home with a drawing that you made in art class that's super abstract or you're coloring outside of the lines. You know, little Susie's like, mommy, mommy, look at this beautiful picture I made for you. She's like, well, that's terrible. It doesn't have a face. Right. Like, what is it? Like, are you stupid? You know, and as sad as that sounds, that kind of stuff happens yeah. as opposed to, wow, look at those colors. Tell me what this streak of red means, yeah. even though the parents like, I have no idea. What <laughs> right. right? <laughs> and so that, that energy that a kiddo gets, that is like this, this, this smacking down of their life force, it internalizes in them. It, be, it gets into their posture the anecdote, the way to heal this, and of course this won't happen until the person is an adult or a very advanced teenager, um, isn't just talking about how terrible my upbringing was. You have to get into the body. You have to feel the body. You have to feel the collapsed energy, maybe the rage where you wanted to like smack that parent or even maybe kill them. Yeah. Right. And doesn't mean to go and kill someone, but you have to start to work on that fight flight that got so deeply suppressed in the physiology, in the spine, in the guts, in the, the, the sensory motor that I was talking about. Yeah. And then the disgust is a not, it's a disgust for the situation that occurred to you. Mm. So it's disgust for what happened. It's very common with folks who were abused sexually, for example, yeah. There will be this disgust and it's, and, and what happens is if they don't understand the difference, they then get disgusted with themselves. Yeah. But what it is, is it actually has to get externalized and pushed out as that was disgusting. That was a disgusting situation. Gross. You know, there's usually smells and things connected with it. And so what often occurs, and this is again, where that education Tara is really important. Yeah. A person might actually feel sick. Like I can't eat today Yeah. or they'll eat and they'll vomit or they'll start dry heaving. Mm. And it can be scary if you don't understand what, be, what might be happening. But, um, I have worked with folks where they're literally like their whole body is convulsing with like vomiting, but they're not vomiting. Wow. Right. It's like this and I won't yeah. replicate it because it's virtually impossible to replicate it if it's not organic, wow. but it's like, if you've ever had food poisoning, you know, that yeah. stuff it's, it's coming up and it hurts your belly. It's like violent. Yeah. Uh, violent. Yeah. And so getting that energy out is so important because when we internalize it, that is what leads to depression. That leads to all of the physiological troubles that basically what we talked about earlier with the fight, flight, freeze being shut down um, and basically wreaking havoc on the system. Now, healthy shame is very different because when a little person is learning right from wrong, you actually have to give them a dose of shame. They have to feel it in the body if a child goes up to a hot stove or a fire or something and they go, they're about to touch it, the only way they're going to know that's bad in a healthy way is a strong, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go yeah. full bore, but like, no, yeah, don't touch that. Like it has to be very direct, right? It has to shock them a little bit and they have to feel a little bit of a, uh -oh. right, right. And then they pull back. Right. Right. It has to be that, but then yeah. it has to be um, connected with connection. Connected mm. with connection. It's like, oh, and because usually then the kid right. will cry, will be a whimper, and then that's where you're. It's okay. Come here. I know right. I scared you, but that is really hot. You're gonna yeah. hurt yourself. Right. You have to teach them that. Yeah. But what sometimes occurs in those situations is a scream, a fright. If a parent doesn't understand the healthy shame, they will scare the child as opposed to healthy shaming them. Mm. And it's usually because the parent doesn't understand healthy shame because they never got it themselves. Right. And then the kids freaked out, the parents freaked out, they scoop them up and then there's terror and <laughs> tears and then they're trying to fix it. 
right. Right. So there is, or they're like, don't touch that. It does like still yelling at them. It comes off as aggressive. (laughs) Right. It's it's not about aggression. It's about, it has to be felt in the body or else they won't understand that it's wrong. Um, and I, you see this too, in like the dog part, you know, people that have dogs will try to teach them right from wrong, but without a strong voice. Yeah. Come on, little ones. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's like, that's not going to (laughs) work. (laughs) <laughs> they work off energy. I have four kids and I've definitely learned that the tone is everything. everything. You almost don't, you almost don't even need words. Mm, <laughs> you can, like, uh, nope. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they know, like, you, you know, know, if you're in the check stand checking out mom, can I get this? Uh, yeah, they're going to keep asking, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah. no, we're not getting that. Like they just know it's over, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And there's um, no question. There's right. no, like, oh, well, maybe if I, no. no, so that, that is something that, um, uh, is very tricky to convey when someone had toxic shame growing up. My husband and I actually did a really good episode where we talked about toxic and healthy shame. Um, this is on your podcast. Yeah. It's on my, what channel. is it called? Uh, I'll have to say it's like healthy shame, toxic shame with my husband, Seth lion. I'll, I'll link it. I'll give it to you and you can. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. It's a great, it's, it's good because we describe how I was brought up with healthy shame and he was nice. Love it. And when we were together, one of our biggest headbutts was, um, uh, he has an adult son now, but when his son was much younger, he was terrified, terrified to ask his son to do anything, uh, like even take out the garbage Oh wow! because it put this, it made my husband feel like terrible. Like he was putting his son out. I'm like, Dude's got to learn how to take out the garbage. Yeah, yeah, right? that'll be great. It, well, right? so anyway, I'll watch that one for sure. It's a very important one because I know there's been kind of this popularization popularization that all shame is bad. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I heard uh, Mark Groves. Do you know Mark? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but no. I heard Mark Groves saying that one time about healthy shame, and I loved his example because I can relate to it being on social media. Yeah. He's like, somebody messaged me and they called me on something. And I had some healthy shame because I realized that wasn't sensitive and messed up that I said that like that. Uh And so I felt, I felt the healthy shame. And now I'm here to tell you, I realized that was insensitive. And he's like, you know, sometimes it's good to feel that a little bit (laughs) because it helps you change, modify your behaviors in a more aligned and healthy way. A hundred percent. If you don't (laughs) tell someone that they've done something wrong, they're going to keep doing it over and over again. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Last thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, like identifying, do you have any insights on, you talked about how you can feel these sensations in your core of your body. Do any certain areas mean certain things or anything like that? Or like, is there any patterns or anything you know about sensations that are enlightening? I wish it was that simple. Um, <laughs> There's not a grid, a little map. It's like right here on your right clavicle me. I wish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, yeah. Cause I know that there's some lines of work that's like, if you feel it here, it's yeah. other thing, if it's here, it's cause you're afraid to put yourself out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think those are nice, but it's also, they're nice in the same way. Astro- astrology <laughs> and, and my yeah. horoscope is a nice thing to look at because like I said, we're all raised so differently. Yeah. What it really comes down to is getting to know what you're feeling, what you're sensing is the better word inside being with it and making sense of it for you. Yeah. I love that because butterflies in the stomach could be excitement, but it also could be terror or it could be a gut hit of that's not right. A tightness in the throat doesn't necessarily mean that you're not speaking up. Right. It can mean a sympathetic reaction because of something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. Like sitting is, with it and intuitively from inside you working with it. Yeah. Starting to understand and notice patterns and like, when yes. does this come up for me? And like, what yes. am I actually feeling right now? So good. I mean, that's kind of how I coach nutrition. I'm like, people say like, what's the best vegetable for me? I'm like, only you can tell only you that you know. Just eat yeah. it and see how you feel. <laughs> and that, and you know, that, that as simple as this sound, like it takes time to re um, invigorate those impulses and connections because right. again, it goes back to our early years, you know, were you right. allowed to express what you were feeling when you were an infant? 
Right. Were you attended to when you needed to eat? Were you right. forced to eat food that you didn't want to eat because that's what you're supposed to eat? Right. You know, it, it goes very far back. Um, one of the things that I teach my students all the time, which is actually something that everyone can do really simply is to follow their biological impulses. So as simple as this sounds, listening to when you have to go to the bathroom, like, can you actually tell when there's pressure in your bladder? Wow. When there's pressure in your rectum, are you denying yourself that just because you need to get through one more thing, one more thing, or do you even know when it's there? Yeah. Because wow. that, that's that autonomic nervous system, yeah. right? It's that, that, that gut level automatic stuff that if we can actually be with it, we start to attune at that base level. Same with hunger. Oh, love that thirst. I'm tired. I mean, and sometimes we do need to, it's like, okay, I'm tired. I'm just going to go to sleep, even though you've got five screaming children that need to be fed. Right. In those moments, then yes, you're going to have to override your fatigue right. and take care of them. But so you have to be discerning about how you also yeah. listen to these impulses. Right. Yeah. I love this. So that is one way to start to get in into this autonomic nervous system. Don't underestimate that it's actually can be very, very powerful. Oh, uh, it's like, it, it's, it's self, um, uh, diving into yourself, uh, noticing, giving yourself attention, like, like honoring, listening mm -hmm. instead of this, like self-rejection, uh, total disconnection from self that I feel yeah. like most of us most were raised people. in. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, gen it's kind of that post-war generation, you yeah. know, have to be stoic, can't right. feel anything because we're all surviving right kind of transferred so you know these conversations that we're having these did not happen with our parents right I know Certainly and, not our grandparents and you know what on that note I just want to say real quick like this is something I've uh, with it's come up with a lot of clients and it's like I I'd say recognizing that our parent your parents weren't able to give you certain things, but also, and, and feeling that fully, but also mm -hmm. having compassion because yeah. they just didn't have, they, they didn't know. have the internet. They didn't have, they had <laughs> nothing, you know, they just didn't no. know any better, you know, no. and they probably, they were raised that way. And so it's yeah. like still feeling your, your pain and all of the things associated with those experiences. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think sometimes it's a block for people to even process stuff because they don't want to like dishonor their parents or, you know, right. there's those kind of things. And it's like, it's not dishonoring. It's just recognizing that, yes, I felt that pain. And I also have compassion as well, because I know you just didn't, you were totally unaware that that was going on. And I know I'm doing it to my kids. I'm like, I tell them all the time. I'm like, just let me know as you figure out how I'm traumatizing you. <laughs> I'm, it's not intentional. I'm not trying to, so just keep me posted good, as you figure them good. out. <laughs> no, it's true. A lot of people will get defensive, um, when they start to uncover this stuff because they want to protect their parents, even right. though they know their parents did wrong to them. And that's a tricky right. one too, because I would say, Tara, that one of the, the hallmarks of folks who don't get better is they will keep that bond with their abusive family systems. I've seen this. And it's really tricky because there will be this sense of if I release that bond that is toxic, I will die. Wow. It's that deep. Wow. Because you would have died when you were three or four or 10, if you had wow. broken. And so this is where mm. a little bit of mindset work actually is important, where you have to work a little bit with your psyche and have like a reasoning conversation. It's like, wait a second, this doesn't mean, and I say this to people like, cause some people's parents have passed. And so there's no need to confront the family because a lot of people think I know it's a very common thing in AA to like go and talk to all the people that you've harmed or whatever. Uh -huh. That isn't always useful. Yeah. Because if those people are not in the same level of awareness as you, right. usually what happens, again, I generalize, is then another trauma happens. Yeah, that's what I always think. It's like, I'm going to tell my parents they weren't there for me. And it's like, they, they no. would have been the way you wanted if they're not, they're still not there. It, it, yeah, it really, <laughs> I find, isn't useful. Um, yeah. It actually can be very damaging. And then what occurs is you try to have that conversation and then you just get smacked down again. Right. And then right. you're like, well, there's no point. It's like, you do not, you do not need to confront any of the perpetrators to heal your stuff. If it happens naturally, 
and both parties are in the same looking in the same direction wonderful and sometimes right. that happens uh-huh. um, but it really doesn't require it doesn't require that kind of interaction because it can just be that they're it's they're just not going to go there yeah so for people because i know this is i know this is common i bet there's more people way more people because obviously they're not talking about it to anyone yeah. including yeah. their own family or themselves really mm-hmm. um because I, I can relate like i i had um sexual molestation growing up and i didn't tell mm-hmm. my ex-husband we were married for 13 years i never told him i was going to tell so no one it just didn't happen Aww. didn't yeah. happen yeah. you know and you know i had my healing from that but i I, there, it wasn't about the person who did it. It was about me understand, like yeah. healing that, like seeing it through a different lens than mm-hmm. through my little girl self, you know, mm-hmm. and looking, revisiting it from my adult perspective yeah. and looking at the whole situation at large. And it's yeah. like, oh, wow, I can see how that can happen. And even for me, even like, I, this is just me personally, but I have compassion on the person who did it. Cause I can see a lot of what led into that. And I'm like, gosh, I'm really glad I'm not him. That would freaking suck, you know? Oh, like, yeah. and so like, there's been a lot of healing for me there, but for somebody who's like the, in the energy of like wanting to protect mm-hmm. their, um, you know, abuser, mm-hmm. I guess one you're saying is you don't need to even talk to them to heal mm-hmm. from this, mm-hmm. but like, do you feel like, I feel like for some people, even admitting that it happened to anyone, is not protecting them anymore. It's defaming them. It's going to make them look bad. Like, I think this is a common thing. Do you have any words of advice there on getting on that yeah, path? I think everyone's very different because, uh-huh. just, you know, sometimes those people aren't even alive anymore. Yeah. Right. And so one of the, if we think of more like sexual trauma, for example, sexual abuse, if we go down that, that, that lane, um, one of the hallmarks is that individual who was abused getting their life force energy back and it has to be done through the body. It can't be just psychological because the system, if we go back to the fight, flight, freeze, it most likely went into shutdown, right? Because if you fought, you would have probably been harmed more, you know, and usually with little kids, they just can't fight. They're too small. Right. And so the, 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 the one thing is to really understand that your body did exactly the right thing by shutting down and not fighting. Yeah. And that can be a very hard pill to swallow, but it needs to be gulped down and felt. And then that's, that's where this education, it's like, no, you actually did the exact right thing Love that. by not fighting. And what occurred to you should never have happened. Yeah. And now what would you have done if you could have? Yeah. So this is where then you have to work with this. Um, it's called, uh, we call it um, annihilation energy. I like to call it kill energy. It's kind of this, like if you could be a superpower or have whatever you wanted to basically annihilate that individual that yeah. did it to you, what would it be? Now, remember how I was talking about the hitting the thing with the baseball yeah. bat. If a person is too terrified to go there, that's fine. That's where you have to build up this yeah. orientation, being with the body, being with the impulses, but eventually, eventually that will come up and out. And when that comes up and out, I've been with it. I've seen it. It is a, such a beautiful event to see a person get that kill energy out because yeah. it literally unlocks something in there, not just their, yeah. their nervous system, but in their soul. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of these early abuse patterns, they, their soul abuse, their spiritual abuse, it, it gets deep into the, the system beyond the, the physical. Um, but yes, this, it's so important. Can't say it enough to work with the body, but also with these fight, flight, freeze reactions. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm mm-hmm. curious I, 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 if anyone's listening and that applies to them, do you work with people privately? How do, do I, people come? You don't anymore? I don't you? anymore. Yeah. My okay. private practice is closed, but All right. um, do not underestimate the online courses that I have. Um, I don't do private practice anymore. I've stopped because it was so clear that people needed education, uh, tools, practices yeah. to build up their capacity so that they could be with whatever comes up because at the end of the day, it won't help them if they have to go see me every time they have to process something. Yeah. Well, and you can help 
more people and you're, you're co- just sorry to, I'm yeah. totally talking over you, but I love what you say on the description of your smart body, smart mind. Mm. It, uh, teaches, teaches you how to become your own medicine. Your medicine. Love that. hundred <laughs> percent, but no, you can, I mean, there are ways to work with practitioners. Um, I did a video that is, I think it's titled how to find a good somatic practitioner. Nice. Okay. Not all of them are created equal. Um, you have nice. to be very discerning. You have to almost interview the person. And in that video, I outline the things that you really should look for. And the reason I say that Tara is uh, our team, my team, we hear really, really terrible stories of people who are trained to do this work and haven't done enough of their own work. Yeah. And then they have blind spots. Right. And then they work with someone who maybe has a history that is just heinous and horrific. Yeah. And they, they don't have the capacity to be with that. And then the person feels right. like shit because they just traumatize their therapist by talking about their story. Wow. Now, story isn't always important, but sometimes a person has to tell their story and just get yeah. it out. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And so if the person on the other end is like oh, going into fright. Oh like, my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's like a, <laughs> Brene Brown calls that like, like when you, when you finally tell your story of shame and then it's received poorly it like oh, yeah. acerbate shame like crazy you know so it's yeah not good. No, well, it's not good so, I, will, yeah. I will find that video and link that Definitely one like and the one, one with you and your husband talking about being raised with healthy and toxic shame that's gonna be so good I'll link that in the yeah. show notes I'll link smart body smart mind she also has one uh this is the one I was referring to before it's called a 21 day nervous system tune-up which I love I love that um yeah. but I'll link that the website if you're listening is just irene lion.com and it's l-y-o-n mm-hmm. and um yeah we'll link everything that we talked about here. Irene, oh. you're amazing. Thank oh, you hey. so Thank much. You. I like, w- I wish you lived in Utah. I'd be like, let's go oh. lunch again. <laughs> we will some other time. We'll, we will. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome.